This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome, glad you could join us uh, tonight. Uh, my name is Mike Policar, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist in our department at uh, UCSF, and I spend uh, most of my professional time nearby at the San Francisco General Hospital, uh, primarily working as uh, an OBGYN in our outpatient clinic, our, in our women's health center at uh, the San Francisco General Hospital. So the way I got involved in, uh, in menopause work actually goes all the way back to my residency. I was a medical student here at UCSF and then did my training, thank you, at uh, my residency training at UCLA, which uh, at that time was quite the powerhouse in terms of research that was going on and looking at the physiology of hot flashes and uh, various effects of menopause on the brain and, and ultimately uh, pioneering a number of treatments. Uh, for menopause. And ever since then, as I've branched out into a number of areas that relate to outpatient women's health care, family planning and uh, various kinds of infections, um, issues related to uh, cancer screening and so on, menopause has always uh, been one of my great loves in terms of uh, an area that I like to lecture about, primarily to clinical audiences, both to OBGYNs and to primary care uh, providers but uh, it's also really fun for me to be able to discuss that with uh, a group of, uh, of consumers as well. So welcome and uh, happy that you could join us. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Also, I don't know if I have to do this um, the way I do at all the other medical lectures that I give, uh, but I have no disclosures uh, to tell you about. I'm not on any speakers bureaus and uh, I don't have any financial source of bias that's based on working with uh, any sort of drug company. So uh, let's start with the terms that are used to describe various aspects of menopause. So menopause itself is a very specific date, it's a, a, a time in a woman's life, which is basically her final menstrual period. We don't use the term last menstrual period because we use that much more in reproductive age women as a way of trying to date a pregnancy. So instead we use final menstrual period. But we never know that it's final until at least 12 months have passed since the woman had her, what uh, we're presuming is her final menstrual period. So if, for example, a 52-year-old woman has a menstrual period in January and then she doesn't bleed again until the following August, she's considered to be perimenopausal, as you'll see in just a moment. But if she goes a whole year without having any menstrual bleeding, then we can look back and say that that was officially her final menstrual period. Now, why is it that women go through menopause in the first place? It's because basically they run out of eggs uh, in the ovary. Every woman is born with somewhere between 400 and 450,000 egg cells uh, in both ovaries, and over time, they are ovulated on a monthly or sometimes less than monthly basis, but sooner or later, the remaining eggs are very resistant to the hormones that cause ovulation, and basically, the ovary runs out of eggs. Uh, at that point, the woman is no longer at risk of pregnancy. The amount of estrogen that she makes from her ovary becomes less and less uh, over time. Uh, and there's also a reduction in the production of male hormones, testosterone, uh, from her uh, ovary. But the interesting thing is that within a few years after menopause, estrogen had previously been the dominant hormone. Now it becomes a fairly minor hormone. And even though testosterone has dropped by ha half, rather, it still uh, becomes sort of the dominant uh, sex steroid uh, in her body. So that's menopause. The next is perimenopause. So perimenopause is defined as the interval from the onset 
of menopausal symptoms. So that might be once menstrual periods start becoming irregular, or a woman might be noticing hot flashes or vaginal dryness until that full year uh, after the final me uh, uh, menstrual period. And then another term that you see not quite as often is called the menopausal transition. And that's the time before the final menstrual period when menstrual cycles start to change, particularly they become irregular and spread out up until the menopause itself. So just to try to make that fairly simple uh, in, so in a fairly linear way, basically a woman goes through her reproductive years from the time that she starts having her menstrual periods until maybe the mid to late 40s, sometimes even the early 50s. Then when she starts having symptoms of going through the change of life, basically hot flashes, vaginal dryness, some of the things I mentioned a moment ago, menstrual irregularity, it's the beginning of the menopausal transition. Then she has her final menstrual period and becomes postmenopausal. But again, that's a retrospective diagnosis. She has to go for a whole year without bleeding. And so the perimenopause is defined as the time from the beginning of the menopausal transition until that year after the final menstrual period has elapsed. And uh, then she's officially uh, considered to be postmenopausal uh, after that. Now, there are a variety of reasons why women go through menopause. The most ob obvious reason is, as I said a moment ago, she runs out of eggs, no longer makes estrogen from her ovaries, and that's considered to be natural menopause. And I've already defined that for you, menopausal symptoms with no bleeding for a year. There are also some biochemical markers that we can use when we're confused about whether or not a woman has actually gone through menopause. Most of the time we can tell and make that as a clinical diagnosis, but there are some circumstances where we're just not quite sure. Maybe she's still having periods and um, the, there's a question about whether or not this is really postmenopausal bleeding or if she's still in the perimenopausal period. Or sometimes a person just wants to know, is there any test you can do to actually confirm that I've gone through menopause? So there are a couple of blood tests that we look at to document whether or not she's gone through menopause. One is if she's 45 years of age or older, we can check a hormone that comes from the pituitary called FSH, and it's usually quite elevated, and her blood estrogen level or estradiol level is reduced. And so high FSH, low estradiol tells us fairly definitively that she's gone through menopause. For a woman who's under 45, let's say it's a woman who's maybe 39 or 41, who stopped having her menstrual periods, that seems like a really young age to have gone through menopause. And so here we check uh, two hormones that come from the pituitary, one called FSH and the other LH, and they're both elevated. Uh, in this younger age group. And if they're both quite high, it not only tells us that she's gone through an early menopause, but also that she's not gonna ovulate and be at risk of pregnancy. So again, we don't do these routinely. We reserve them only for those situations when there's some confusion or with um, an early menopause, but otherwise we rely on clinical findings. Now, as I said, there are other reasons that women might go through menopause. So another is called induced menopause. So about a third of women by the end of, the, of their lives in the United States have a hysterectomy for one reason or another. If a woman has a hysterectomy and her ovaries removed simultaneously, let's say because of endometriosis or an infection or maybe a, an ovarian or other type of pelvic cancer, when her ovaries are surgically removed, that's uh, referred to as induced menopause. Another is that the ovaries can fail as a result of exposure to certain drugs, particularly chemotherapy drugs or to radiation uh, therapy. And then there is a clinical syndrome which is referred to as premature menopause. And basically, as you'll see in a moment, basically any time that the ovaries fail at an age of 40 years of age or older, it's considered to be true menopause. But if a woman goes through menopause at an age younger than 40, that's called premature menopause. And there are a number of reasons for, uh, for that happening. One is that sometimes there's a genetic problem where instead of being 46XX, as most women are, uh, instead there might be a condition which is called a mosaicism where her chromosomes are a little different than other um, chromosomally normal women and that would lead to an early menopause. There's also an autoimmune condition that can lead to early menopause as well. And the major risk of that is the fact that a woman's ovaries may fail at a time when she's not done with childbearing. 
And then she needs to see the reproductive endocrinology and infertility experts with a, uh, at least the question of whether or not there might be some way of either through ovum transfer or other ways of inducing ovulation for her to actually get pregnant if she'd like to be able to. But it's difficult to do in a woman who's had uh, premature uh, menopause. Now, the next thing to say about menopause is when it happens and how long it is that a woman is likely to experience symptoms of her menopause. So the average age of menopause in the United States is about 51 and a half years old. So anything after 40 is considered to be normal. Some women don't go through menopause until they're 56 or 58, but on average, it's about 52, um, 51 and a half or 52 years old. When an individual woman goes through menopause is largely genetically determined. And the single best indicator of when a woman is gonna go through menopause is when her mother went through menopause. And that's often a question I ask of women who are going through menopause in their early 40s who have questions about why they're going through menopause so early is that if their mother went through menopause at an equally early age, um, that means that there's some genetic reason why they're um, in the early part of the bell-shaped curve, so to speak, in terms of the early age at which uh, they've had menopause. On the other hand, the age of menopause doesn't seem to be related to a woman's race, how many pregnancies she's had, what her height or weight are, her socioeconomic status, or her age at her first menstrual period. So if you were to start your periods at 10 instead of 13 or 14, you're not going to run out of eggs any earlier. Uh, that really doesn't seem to have an influence on when you actually go through menopause. We do know, however, that women who smoke cigarettes usually will have menopause about a year or two earlier than women who don't smoke cigarettes. And that really hasn't been fully figured out why it is that cigarette smoking, especially heavy cigarette smoking, um, causes the ovaries to fail a little earlier in uh, comparison to women who don't smoke cigarettes. So an interesting relationship to see is the fact that since the 1850s, the age of menopause hasn't changed. As you can see, it's a little over 50 years of age, all the way from the 1850s until um, where we are currently. However, female life expectancy has changed hugely over that time period, so that in the 1850s, women would live to maybe 45 or 48 years old on average. And then, of course, there's been an improvement in life expectancy for a variety of reasons ever since then. But the reason I show this is to say that if the average woman has menopause at 51, and the average woman is now living until 86 or 87 uh, years old, many women spend almost half their life being menopausal. So you can see that what's really changed is that in the 1850s, the average woman didn't even make it to menopause. And now a majority of women actually have decades of full and happy lives after the time of their menopause. And that's one of the things that's really led to a lot of the research in finding good quality treatments for menopausal symptoms because of the fact that women may, may experience that for an extended uh, period of time. So let's go on to the next phase and talk about what the effects are of, of a woman losing her estrogen at the time that she goes through menopause. And first I'll summarize what those are, and then we'll talk about each of them in a little bit more detail after that. So of course, the most well-known and widely experienced symptom of menopause is what medically is called a vasomotor symptom, and you'll see that abbreviated VMS. But colloquially, it's women who talk about their hot flashes, also referred to as hot flushes. And then another manifestation of vasomotor symptoms are having night sweats, which are actually due to nighttime hot flashes. The next is some changes in the brain so that there are neuro neurobehavioral issues that occur in at least some women who go through menopause. The most important of which is sleep problems. There are many women who have gone through menopause who will tell you that, you know, I did okay with the hot flashes, but the problem was that I had difficulty getting to sleep or I'd fall asleep and then wake up in the middle of the night, sometimes drenched with sweat, which again is a, um, uh, when that happens, is more of a manifestation of the vasomotor symptoms. We'll also talk a little bit about some of the short-term memory changes that some women experience um, in menopause. Next is, uh, a condition that has been up there all along, that it has a new name. It's called genitourinary symptom of menopause, GSM. But it refers to all of the changes that happen in the skin of the vagina and in the bladder. 
And as I said, we'll review those in just a moment. But for some women, that's their major complaint. Intercourse used to be very comfortable. Now it isn't. Or I'm having lots of new symptoms that are related to urination that I didn't have uh, before. So it could be vaginal dryness, painful intercourse, burning on urination, or even losing a little bit of urine on the way uh, to the bathroom. Next one is the fact that once a woman's gone through menopause and her estrogen levels drop, there's an accelerated phase of bone loss. So for about seven years after the final menstrual period, the rate at which women lose bone is accelerated, and then it slows down after that initial seven years. So every year after that, there continues to be bone loss, but not as much as there is during that first seven years uh, after the final uh, menstrual period. Now, the result of that bone loss is an increased risk of fractures. And the types of fractures which are most common and in some ways most worrisome are hip fractures, which is a major problem for uh, elderly women, and then vertebral fractures, which means that the vertebral bodies in our spine sometimes can collapse. And the result of that is bending forward, something which is called a dowager's hump. But you may have heard that, uh, or the medical term for it, which is a do dorsal kyphosis. And then also there is, for women, an increased risk of arterial vascular problems like heart attack and stroke, although that really doesn't start picking up until the 60s and thereafter. And it's really interesting that for men, their increased risk of heart attack and stroke starts in the mid or the late 40s. For women, that doesn't really start until the mid 50s into the 60s or even later. And so there's thought to be actually a protective effect um, of the estrogen that a woman makes from her own ovaries in terms of preventing heart attacks until uh, she uh, goes through the time of menopause and then slowly, slowly after that, her heart attack uh, and stroke risk uh, increase. So let's talk about each of those in a little bit more detail, but I'm going to spend most of that focus talking about hot flashes, which are the most common of the complaints. So the reason I added this slide is because of the fact that it gives you an idea about how common the... Uh, various vasomotor and uh, genitourinary complaints are. And it's kind of a busy slide, but if you look at the yellow bars, it tells you about how often things occur in postmenopausal women. In purple, it's perimenopausal, and in green, it's premenopausal women. But focus mainly on the yellow lines. So the frequency of hot, or the percentage, I should say, of women who have hot flashes in the menopause uh, is way up there. It's at about 65%. So about two-thirds of women who have gone through menopause, at some point as they go through the transition, will complain of hot flashes or hot flushes, as it's shown uh, in this slide. Next is night sweats, which occur in a majority of women, as you can see, about 55% of women, followed by vaginal dryness. That's present in about 40% of women, and then painful intercourse, which occurs in about 25% of women. So obviously common symptoms, but particularly the hot flashes and the night sweats are among the most commonly experienced manifestations of menopause when you look at a population of people. So let's describe in a little bit more deal what a, uh, or in a little more detail, I'm sorry, exactly what a hot flash is and how, how it's experienced. So it is described as a sudden sense of intense body heat, and it has a particular progression that's associated with it. So it usually starts in the trunk, sometimes in the chest, but particularly in the trunk, then spreads to the neck and then to the face uh, after that. And the reason for the hot flash, basically, is because of the fact that, think of it as a blush. Basically, uh, the blood vessels in the chest, the neck, and then ultimately the face <laughs> dilate. They open up, and as they have more blood in them, that's the reason that a person kind of has a red look to their face or their chest in, in the way that a, a person would during a blush. Now, where the hot flash is actually getting started is in the brain. Somehow the brain gets a signal that the body's overheating. And the way that we all, man or woman, re react to overheating is that our blood vessels open up, we vasodilate, and then we sweat as a way of trying to dump that excess heat. So basically, because of this trigger that the brain experiences, thinking that it's overheated, the way that we respond to it basically is with the flushing that may be experienced as a hot flash, then the redness, then the sweating that occurs uh, afterwards. Now, a hot flash can last anywhere from a few seconds for some women up to several minutes. 
A few women actually describe them as lasting up to 20 minutes or a half hour, but that's unusual. For most women, a hot flash might be described as lasting five minutes or 10 minutes. They're always worse at night, but they can occur at any time of day. So one of the questions I always ask patients as we, as we discuss their hot flashes is, do they have a tendency to be worse in the evening and when you're trying to go to bed, or do you have them all day? And most women will say, I only have them at night. Occasionally, I have them during the day. And if I ever see a patient who says, I only get hot flashes in the morning, then I always think of something else. Maybe they have thyroid problems. Maybe they have diabetes. Maybe their blood sugars are too low or too high or some other rare condition. But hot flashes are never confined only to the day and not to the night. They'll either be at night only or during the day um, and uh, during the night. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, most women who have gone through menopause have experienced hot flashes or sometime, at some time uh, or another. They may start as early as the perimenopause. So even while a woman is still having periods, she might be having hot flashes. For other women, the hot flashes don't start until their menstrual periods have stopped. The conventional wisdom, and I'm going to tell you about some new studies in just a moment, but the conventional wisdom is that most women, the average woman, experiences hot flashes for about two years, and then they have a tendency to get better. But we've known for a long time that at least a quarter of women have hot flashes for at least five years after their menopause. And we knew that the women most likely to do that were slender white women who were most likely to have those very prolonged um, episodes of hot flashes. But I'll also tell you about a study that you may have heard about because there's been a lot in the news today about it, which is called the SWAN study. That's an acronym for the study of women across America. Um, and uh, basically what uh, the SWAN study did, or I shouldn't say across America, across the nation. So study of women across the nation. So it looks for basically whether or not there are ethnic or racial differences in how people experience hot flashes. And what they found is that as a proportion of people in different ethnic and racial groups, that hot flashes are more likely in African-American women, less common in Chinese and uh, Japanese women, and uh, Latina women and other white women are somewhere in between uh, those uh, two poles. And just so I could move on to other things, I was going to say, just check this one study if it's something that you're, uh, that you're interested in. I've also men mentioned already that smoking is a risk factor for early menopause. Uh, it is a risk factor for hot flashes. And obesity is a, hot, uh, is a risk factor for hot flashes, kind of paradoxically, because um, obese postmenopausal women make more estrogen in the menopause, not so much from their ovaries. It's actually um, sex steroids that are coming from their adrenal gland that are converted in the fat to weak estrogens. Um, so you'd think that obese women would actually have fewer hot flashes, but in reality, they have more. So what do I keep talking about in terms of this update? I'm going to skip over this. Uh, just this morning, uh, there was a publication of an article in the JAMA Internal Medicine that was an update on information that came from the SWAN. And basically, this part of the study included about 3,300 women. The SWAN study was done in seven sites throughout the United States. And one of its amazing attributes, other than the fact that it was a fairly large study, is the fact that they developed a cohort of women who they followed for 17 years. So they started following these women in 1996 and then followed them all the way through, um, through 2013. And so the median number that sort of the 50th percentile of visits was that women had 13 visits over the time period that they were followed uh, in the SWAN study. So what do they find and what was it that hit the New York Times this morning about uh, the publication of this article? Well, remember I said a few minutes ago that the conventional wisdom was that the average woman had hot flashes for two years. It turns out that from the high quality SWAN study that the median duration of vasomotor symptoms was actually more like seven and a half years from the time they started until the time they finished. So if they start in the perimenopause, go through the time of the final menstrual period and last for a few years after that, it turns out that the median group, can't call it the average, it's the 50th percentile, actually had hot flashes for a much longer period than what was previously uh, estimated that the median time for the post-final menstrual period persistence of hot flashes was about four and a half years after your last period. 
and that if you are premenopausal or early perimenopausal, when you first started having hot flashes, that turned out to be the best predictor of the fact that you would have hot flashes for a long time. So if you started having hot flashes while you were still having periods, the average duration of hot flashes was about 11.8 years, almost 12 years. And the post final menstrual period persistence was for about nine years. So kind of surprising information just because we had so many decades of information which said that for most women, the period of hot flashes was less. But based on this, one, this part of the SWAN study that was published today, it looks like um, the typical woman is actually having hot flashes for a much longer period. African-American women had the longest duration of vasomotor symptoms, a median of 10 years. Women who are postmenopausal at the time that their hot flashes started actually had the shortest duration. So if you were a woman who didn't have hot flashes before your last period, then you had your last period, let's say a year or two after your last period, then you started having hot flashes. That was fairly predictive that you're only going to have them for a few years. But even then, it was still longer than the old um, conventional wisdom. And then they found other factors that were related to vasomotor symptom duration and persistence were, again, menopause at a younger age, lower educational levels, greater perceived stress and symptom uh, sensitivity. In other words, if you were a person who really focused on your hot flashes, you were likely to have the sense that you experienced them even longer. And then women who had symptoms of depression and anxiety when they first started having the hot flashes were more likely to have them for a longer time period. And this is going to change the landscape. I think primarily in terms of how long we feel comfortable offering therapy for hot flashes. Because in the past we said, let's go ahead and treat you for a couple of years and then you may not need it after that. And what this is saying is, no, you may, may need it for a lot longer than two years, five years, seven years, 10 years, uh, might be necessary to keep your hot flashes under control. Okay, so just a few more things then in detail about the various uh, changes that happen in menopause, and then we'll talk about treatments. So I've already mentioned that a common problem in women going through menopause are disturbances of restful sleep. And here the operative word is restful. Women can sleep okay, but they oftentimes feel just kind of lousy in the morning. And it's true for a couple of reasons. One is because it may be hard to go to sleep. It may be because you wake up uh, in the middle of the night and find it hard to get back to sleep. But the person I mentioned earlier at UCLA, a fellow named Howard Judd, did some elegant sleep studies right in the UCLA hospital in our clinical research unit where women were allowed to sleep overnight, but they had a galvanometer on their finger, which actually measured whether or not they were sweating. And then he looked at a number of other parameters, uh, like how deeply a woman was in sleep. And it turns out that for women who were having lots of hot flashes, not enough to wake them up, but nonetheless, the hot flashes were registering because of the sweats. They never got into a very deep rapid eye movement sleep or a REM sleep. While for the women who are not having overnight hot flashes, they were able to cycle through much deeper levels of sleep. And the interesting thing is that the women were having, who are having hot flashes oftentimes didn't wake up in the middle of the night, but they were having these subliminal nocturnal hot flashes anyway, and they just couldn't get a restful sleep because they couldn't get the deep REM sleep that they needed. So it's not surprising that the result of that for some people who are not sleeping very well is irritability, fatigue, poor concentration the next day just because you didn't have enough REM sleep, sleep cycles overnight because you were having these hot flashes that weren't enough to wake you up. So that's probably where they're coming from. Now, some of the other neurobehavioral changes that come up are short-term memory problems. So there are some women who will tell you that before I went through menopause, I was really quick. You know, I could balance my checkbook without writing a single number down. I'd come out to Mission Bay and I'd park my car in a parking lot and I'd always remember where it is. But for some people, that short-term memory sort of goes downhill shortly after menopause. No question, a lot of that is aging. It happens to men as well as women. But for some women, it's particularly profound in the few years after they've gone uh, through menopause. Other sorts of neurobehavioral things that come up for some women are emotional swings and anxiety, maybe some of that is related to sweet, sleep rather. But depression itself is definitely not related to estrogen deficiency. Depression is a little bit more common in women who are going through menopause or who have gone through menopause, but you can't 
somehow relate that due to estrogen deficiency. And if you give those women estrogen therapy, it doesn't make depression any better, although it may help with the um, emotional swings and anxiety. Next is that there may be changes in sex drive. And for some women, their sex drive is less because of the fact that they have less testosterone than they used to. It's now the dominant hormone, but there's still only half as much of it as there used to be, and where men and women get their sex drive is from testosterone. In addition to that, some women may be adverse to having intercourse because it hurts, uh, just with the vaginal dryness and changes that happen with uh, the reduction in estrogen. Other women, however, actually are more sexually active in menopause than they were before, mainly because they're no longer at risk of getting pregnant, but also um, just related to divorce or maybe a partner dying, um, then they might have a new partner, which has a, also has a tendency to rejuvenate uh, sexual relationships. So uh, there is a researcher in Australia uh, whose last name is Dennerstein, who's done a couple of amazing cohorts of studies of following women starting in their mid-40s and following them through their mid-50s and into their 60s. And her area of expertise is just following changes in libido and sexuality and so on as women go through various phases of, um, of menopause. And that's where this data comes from about the fact that it's not... Um, necessarily neutral, that there are those women who don't have much in the, in the, in the way of changes of libido, but for some women, they have more interest and others uh, have less. And then, as I said, it, in any of these studies, it's difficult to separate some of the psychological effects that are directly related to estrogen, as opposed to just the changes we all go through in getting older, facing our mortality, changes in how society relates to us as we get older, uh, poor sleep cycles, uh, and so on. Now, um, next on the list then are some of the genitourinary changes that come up as a result of lower estrogen levels. And as I said, in the medical literature, this has a new name, which is called GSM. It used to be called atrophic vaginitis, which really sounds <laughs> it sounds worse than it is for most people. So they kind of medicalize the name just so it wouldn't sound like, uh, like the vagina is getting dry and shriveled. So the kinds of changes that come up in GSM are vaginal spotting or bleeding, vaginal dryness. Sometimes sex can be um, uncomfortable because of less lubrication and the vagina is less elastic or stressy. Uh, stretchy, excuse me, stressy, stretchy. Uh, and then for some women, orgasm can take longer after they become menopausal and less intense than when they were um, younger women. And m virtually all of these changes are directly related to the drop in estrogen levels. But interestingly, embryologically, the bladder and the urethra where the urine comes out uh, actually have estrogen um, receptors in them. So the lower part of the urinary system basically has the same embryologic origin as the vagina and therefore um, needs estrogen to stay healthy. So in some women, um, the kinds of symptoms that they might have is the sense of, oh, I've really got to get to the bathroom. That's urgency. Frequency meaning that I not only have to pee a lot during the day, but I have to get up a few times at night. Burning when I urinate. Urgent continence means I lose a little bit of urine on the way to the bathroom. Oftentimes, that's misdiagnosed as being a bladder infection. Because most of the time, if you go in and say, I'm peeing more frequently, it burns when I urinate, I have to go way more often than I used to, what comes to mind is a bladder infection. But if you were to get a dipstick or a urine culture, that would turn out to be negative. These are simply symptoms of the loss of estrogen on the urethra and the bladder. Now, the loss of estrogen does not have an effect on what's called stress incontinence. Stress incontinence is the circumstance that happens, mainly in postmenopausal women, of when you cough or sneeze or bend over or run for a bus, all of a sudden you find that you've leaked a little bit of urine without any warning and without any sense that you had to urinate beforehand. So stress incontinence has nothing to do with estrogen levels. It's far more related to how many kids you've had and what your labors were like and how much the vaginal muscles were stressed. Estrogen doesn't cause it and doesn't fix it. And the same is true of what's called pelvic organ prolapse, when the muscles in the vagina that hold up the bladder and the rectum uh, get overstretched, again, from childbirth. Uh, even though those problems are more likely to be seen in menopausal women, they have nothing to do with uh, the loss of estrogen, and they don't get better when you give estrogen back. The next is I mentioned earlier that once a woman goes through menopause that 
She has a tendency to lose bone mineral density. And that's true for a couple of reasons. Number one is that we don't absorb calcium from our intestines as well, whether that comes from milk or cheese or Tums or whatever the source of the calcium is, we don't do as well in absorbing it. And number two is that our bones are always going through a process that's causing, that's called remodeling. So all of us all the time are breaking down bone and we're building up bone. And for most people, those two things are in balance. And so our bone density is about the same. However, during that seven year period when women seem to be losing more bone density, it's because of the fact that even though laying down of the bone happens at the same rate, they lose more bone. So there's more bone resorption, but not more formation to make up for it. So ultimately bone mineral density goes down, especially in that first seven years uh, after uh, menopause. So, 75% of bone loss that happens in the first 15 years after menopause is directly related to estrogen deficiency. I already told you about the dowager's hump that can happen from multiple spinal compression fractures. And it's, account, it's the reason why as women become elderly, a lot of them start to lose height. The reason you get smaller, the same is true for men. It's not because we're shrinking, it's because of the fact that we have compression fractures in our spine and we get shorter. Uh, as a result of that. The other is that about one in five postmenopausal women will experience a hip fracture during the remainder of her life. About a sixth of those are fatal, not so much directly from the fracture, but maybe the immobilization that happens afterwards, and you might get a blood clot in your leg that flips off and goes to your lungs. And about a quarter of women who've experienced a hip fracture require long-term care. It's really interesting that if you look at women in nursing homes, that one of the most common reasons for long-term um, care in a nursing home is because of changes related to Alzheimer's. The second most common cause, it, cause is loss of mobility from a hip fracture. So it not only can cause death, but it really causes major changes in sort of quality of life as well if you should sustain, uh, sustain rather a hip fracture. And the last thing that, that, that I wanna mention is, as I told you, men are, excuse me, women are relatively protected against heart attacks in comparison to men. For men, that increased heart attack risk starts in the 40s. For women, it doesn't start until the late 50s and into the 60s. However, by the time that men and women are in their 70s, the risk of heart attack, MI stands for myocardial infarction, is about equal for men and women. And you probably know this already, but I'll remind you is that and even though we're very focused on cancer as a cause of death in both men and women, the single most common cause of death in both men and women is cardiovascular disease. Half of all women who die, die of cardiovascular disease. Um, and even though we think about breast cancer as being a major killer, the next 100 women who are, well, that's probably not the best way to describe it, but a woman's lifetime risk of dying of breast cancer is about one in 32. Her lifetime risk of dying of, of heart disease is one in two. So the point is, is that heart disease is a much, much more common cause of death in women than any type of individual cancer. Okay, so enough about the possibilities of what, change, what changes in menopause. Let's go on now and talk about the various ways of dealing with those symptoms. And, and in particular, I'm gonna focus not only on some of the traditional things we've done, but some of the newer things um, that are out there. Okay, so let's just start with sort of the lifestyle changes that have been shown to help women deal with menopausal hot flashes. So we know from a number of trials that exercise by itself, particularly if it's at least three or four days a week, has a tendency to make hot flashes less frequent and less intense when they happen. The reason for that is just exercising at least 30 minutes per day, three or four days a week, causes a relief, release of endorphins in the brain and those endorphins actually then have an effect on neighboring areas of the brain in terms of making hot flashes less common and less intense. Second is relaxation therapy. So there are actually some studies that look at before and after rates of hot flashes in women who, let's say, do a yoga class, for example. So learning how to do focusing exercises, for example, can help some women uh, with their hot flashes. Next is the ambient temperature of the room you're in, and of course, that just kind of becomes obvious to some people or women talking to their friends or their mother or other people who have gone through menopause. One of the things that becomes clear 
um, fairly quickly is that if you cool off your surroundings, then you don't experience the intensity of the hot flash uh, nearly as much. So at night, a woman can open a window, turn on a fan, turn down the thermostat. By cooling the room that she's in, then her hot flashes will be um, less intense. Now, during the day, that may be a little bit more difficult to do while you're at work. So here the recommendation is trying to dress in layers. So if you're feeling overheated, you can take off one layer uh, at a time and still be comfortable. For some women, not all, um, hot or spicy foods can be a trigger of a hot flash. So maybe uh, it would be worth a try to avoid them, avoid cigarette smoking, and also to try to minimize alcohol. So for some women, that's really all they need to get their hot flashes under control. Some of the things that have been found not to make much difference is that there are studies that looking, look at homeopathic medications, at acupuncture, and at magnetic therapy, and none of those things really seem to make very much difference. All right, let's go to the next level, which are called botanicals and phytoserms. Now, you probably have heard the term phytoestrogen, which means plant-derived estrogen. But the point is, is that there are there really are very few natural plant-derived estrogen, plant estrogens, as you'll see in just a moment. There are maybe CIRMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators, but not true estrogen, which comes from plants. So a lot of different compounds have been looked at. One that's probably better than placebo comes from a plant called black cohosh. The other ones that have been looked at are all the things on this list. So isoflavones that come from soy, like in tofu or other kinds of soy-bearing um, uh, vegetables. Red clover isoflavones, there's a popular product which is called Promensil, which comes from red clover, doesn't seem to help. Evening of primrose oil doesn't. Dongkwai is a herb that's used in Chinese herbal medicine, and there's been a couple of studies that compare Dongkwai to placebo, because no better although most Chinese herbalists will tell you that they never use Dong Kwai by itself. They always mis mix it with other herbs, and so they say that study shouldn't apply. Ginseng, vitamin E, chaseberry, which has a generic name of, of uh, Agnes castus vitex, none of them seem to help. So the only one that has some value is black cohosh in treating hot flashes. So what we know about black cohosh is that it's not an estrogen, it's not something which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's marketed as a supplement, not as a prescription drug, and therefore you can buy it in Safeway or GNC or Trader Joe's or all over the internet. So you don't need a prescription for it. You can basically buy it in any um, pharmacy or drugstore or health food store uh, or um, grocery. That's what I was looking for. It has a number of names, like Remy Femin is the common European name. Estroven is the common name in the United States. It's given in a dose anywhere between 40 and 80 milligrams daily. And it has very few adverse effects. So headaches, stomach discomfort, heaviness in the legs for some women. So as I said, there are many different brands and formulations, but the one you find most commonly is called Estroven. This just comes from the package label. It has lots of different vitamins and minerals in it. And then um, basically what it tells us down here is that it does have some isoflavones. It has black cohosh root, in this particular case, 40 milligrams, uh, and then a few other components. But there, as I said, there are many different ways um, to, to obtain black cohosh without a prescription as a supplement uh, over the counter. Now, how well does it work? The answer in these various studies that have been done looking at black cohosh is that a little over half of women have an improvement in their hot flashes with black cohosh compared to about a 30% response rate in the placebo group. So the good news is it does seem to work better than placebo. The bad news is, is, is that there's a very strong placebo effect. And of those 60% of women who have a reduction in their hot flashes, Maybe half of them are reacting to the chemical that's in the black cohosh, and the other half just are improving because of the placebo effect. But in a way, that doesn't matter whether or not it's the active ingredient or the placebo effect. If there are fewer hot flashes, then that can be a perceived benefit, particularly for a product which is so easy to purchase and has relatively few side effects. But there's no question that this doesn't work as well as estrogen. It's much milder in its effect. As I said, it has very, relatively few adverse effects, and it is considered to be a reasonable sort of first-line choice for women who have mild 
hot flashes, not the kind that wake you up in the middle of the night or prevent you from going to work. But if they are mild hot flashes, this may help. It's also a reasonable first choice for women who feel strongly about avoiding hormones and would rather be able to use something that's a little bit more sort of naturally derived. And you've also got to be a person who's willing to use over-the-counter medications that are sold as supplements and not necessarily rigorously tested by the FDA. But as I said, the track record is that they are reasonably safe. And I do recommend these commonly to patients who are having fairly mild hot flashes or who, women who can't or won't use uh, hormones. And I don't think I reflected it well in the slide, but I want to say one other thing about it. This is actually a fairly popular approach to menopause menopausal symptoms for women who really can't use particularly estrogen, but really I'd say any steroid therapy, and that's particularly women who have had breast cancer. So women who have been treated for breast cancer, given the advice that they should avoid systemic estrogen and progesterone for the rest of their life because there's an ongoing concern that if not all of the breast cancer was eradicated, that using estrogen or progesterone might cause a recurrence or might lead to a recurrence of a woman's breast cancer. In the case of black cohosh, it's very clear that this has no estrogenic effect. It doesn't plug into estrogen receptors at all. So if a woman's had breast cancer and is experiencing hot flashes, what this is, does is it has sort of a serotonin-like effect on the brain, which may help with mild hot flashes, but it's certainly not going to have any negative effect on uh, recurrence of her breast cancer. So that may be another role that black cohosh has. All right, the next level of treatment is to mention to you prescription drugs, but drugs that don't have any hormones in them. So this is a nice kind of summary of what the various studies have shown. So these are the percentage of treated patients who have at least a 50% reduction in their hot flashes. These are the percentage of placebo patients who have at least a 50% reduction in their hot flashes. So these are a variety of drugs, with the exception of gabapentin, I'll come to that one in just a minute, that are used to treat depression. So as these various SSRIs and SNRI drugs came out 15 or 20 years ago to treat depression, one of the side effects that was noticed for these antidepressant medications is that for many women, their hot flashes got better. So there's a, a, a SNRI, which is called venlafaxine. Its trade name is Effexor. And somewhere around two-thirds of women will have a reduction in their hot flashes. And in a study of venlafaxine compared to placebo, it was clearly better than placebo, but again, a fairly strong placebo effect. Paroxetine, you may know of as Paxil. And Paxil works even better in terms of treating hot flashes in comparison to the placebo group. Sertraline is another, which is not quite as effective as venlafaxine or paroxetine. Uh, Escitalopram, um, which has a trade name of Lexapro, has recently had a number of studies looking at that uh, as well. And then there's another drug which is used basically for seizure disorders, although now it's used for um, chronic pain problems as well, uh, which is called gabapentin. And gabapentin has a fairly good track record in stopping hot flashes. This kind of refers to some of the older studies. The more recent studies say up to 70 or 80% of women who use gabapentin will have a reduction in their hot flashes. So now in the medical oncology community, for a woman who's had breast cancer who shouldn't use estrogen or progesterone for the rest of her life, the number one recommendation is actually for her to use gabapentin. Now, as I said, black cohosh may help, but it doesn't help as much as gabapentin does for women who can't or won't take estrogen. Now, this is all based on really good comparative studies, but a logical question is, has the FDA approved any of these drugs specifically for the purpose of hot flashes? And the answer is, yeah, they did about a year ago. So there's a version of paroxetine, again, what by trade name is known of as Paxil, um, in a low dose, 7.5 milligrams, because Paxil is usually used like 10 or 15 or 20 milligrams or even higher. But in this very low dose of paroxetine, it turns out that it does a fairly good job of hot flashes. So there is a drug on the market that has the trade name of Brisdel, which is the only SSRI which is actually approved by the Food and Drug Administration for the purpose of treating hot flashes. Now, you could use any of them. They all work well. None of them work quite as well as estrogen, but they're all perfectly reasonable choices. But if you wanted to use an FDA-approved drug specifically for hot flashes that doesn't have 
hormones in it, then that would be Brisdel, which is in this low dose FDA approved for the treatment of uh, hot flashes. All right, so let's go to the next level then, which is using hormone therapy for hot flashes. So <clears throat> this comes from a recent statement from a group called NAMS, the North American Medical, uh, excuse me, North American Menopause Society. They do a really good job of writing evidence-based guidelines for management of various kinds of menopausal problems. So they point out that of all those different levels of treatment, that hormone therapy is the most effective treatment for vasomotor symptoms. And no matter how much research we do in the other things, the hormones always seem to work the best. And so the options are to use estrogen by itself. We do that for women who have had a hysterectomy. A combination of estrogen and progesterone, which is what we use for women who have a uterus. There's a brand new drug that's come out within the last year that's a combination of estrogen and a CIRM-like drug called basidoxephine. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in just a moment. And another possibility for women who can't or won't use estrogen or don't tolerate it very well is just to use the progesterone part by itself. Then the other thing I'll tell you about in just a moment is that in women who are perimenopausal, let's say late 40s, maybe even 50, having hot flashes, but still having menstrual periods, there's a small but definite risk of pregnancy. And so what those women can do is actually to use oral contraceptives at a very low dose, both to prevent pregnancy, regulate their menstrual cycles, and then also treat their hot flashes. So we'll consider that possibility as well. So those are all the things that are available in terms of different hormonal approaches to hot flashes. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but this is the NAMS-approved list of various kinds of abbreviations. So ET is estrogen by itself. EPT is estrogen and progestin. The kind of umbrella terms that describe a combination of hormones are HT, which is hormone therapy, or MHD, which stands for menopausal hormonal therapy. So you may see a few, few of these abbreviations, but I'll try to go over them uh, again as you see them. So when it comes to treating hot flashes with hormone therapy, the thing that really gets the hot flashes under control is the estrogen therapy. And there's so many different ways to give estrogen. So there are six different types of pills. There are a number of preparations that go through the skin. They're called transdermal. So there are seven different patches, two gels, one emulsion, and one spray, all of which have estrogen in them. And then you can also deliver estrogen directly into the vagina. So there are two types of creams. There's one type of intravaginal tablet, and there are two different kinds of estrogen rings. So there's many ways of trying to get the estrogen in the body. It's a matter of what's most convenient and which one seems to work best for an individual uh, woman. Then there are also combination products with estrogen and progestin in them. So two different kinds of pills that have estrogen and progestin and two different patches that have estrogen and progestin as well. Now, how do we decide what, what are we going to start with? Well, for a woman who does not have a uterus, she's already had a hysterectomy for one reason or another, the recommendation is to use estrogen by itself. But if she has a uterus and you use estrogen for her, then what the estrogen can do is to cause the lining of the uterus to overgrow and at some point actually become a cancer endometrial cancer. So we never give estrogen by itself to a woman who has a uterus. We always have to give estrogen to treat her hot flashes and a second drug called progestin to prevent endometrial cancer. But in a woman who's already had a hysterectomy, that's not an issue. So then our next step is, well, if she has a uterus, we're going to use estrogen and progestin. We want to be able to give it in a way that's either going to prevent postmenopausal bleeding or if bleeding happens, to at least try to make it predictable. So there are two different ways to do this. One is, if she hasn't had any bleeding at all for a few months, you give estrogen every day and progestin every day, which is something called continuous combined. On the other hand, if she's recently had some bleeding or newly menopausal, we give estrogen every day, but we cycle the progestin on and off. And that one's called the continuous sequential regimen. But it gets a little confusing. I'm not going to go through all of that in great detail. But I will tell you a little bit more about how we decide which estrogen to use and what dose to use. So the whole idea is to use the lowest effective estrogen and progestin dose that 
effectively treats our hot flashes. But of course, we do that with any drug. We want to use the lowest dose of the drug that gets us to the point that we want to in terms of having a beneficial effect. Now, the reason that NAMS had to come right out and say that is because before the Women's Health Initiative was published in the early 2000s, women were usually started on sort of a middle dose of estrogen. And then we kind of worked up or worked down. But ever since the WHI, we always start with the lowest dose and work up. And it turns out that for most women, low doses are all they need. They're better tolerated, and they're almost certainly safer than the standard doses are. So we start at low doses. Patient gets started on that. She comes back four or six weeks later. The patient says, I feel great. We leave her on the low dose. If she says, you know, I'm doing better, but I'm just not there yet, then we slowly go up on the dose, okay? The next thing that NAM says is that even though you might get a woman's hot flashes under control by her taking oral estrogen or patch estrogen, it may not enough may be enough to get the vaginal symptoms under control. So it's okay to use oral or patch estrogen, but at the same time to use some vaginal estrogen just to make sure that that problem gets adequately taken care of uh, as well. Okay, so the way we do this is we start with a low-dose pill or a low-dose patch. And a logical question is, well, which one should I use? And I always present this to patients in such a way of, it all depends on whether you're comfortable remembering to take a pill every day, or you'd rather have a patch that you change twice a week. Most of the patches are twice a week patches, so you change every Monday and every Thursday. A few of the patches are weekly patches, so you only have to change every Sunday, for example. Okay, and the patches come in various sizes. There's one called the Vivel Dot, which really is a dot. It's really small, very translucent plastic, basically, and you change it um, infrequently, basically. So as I said, it's going to be either a once-a-week patch or a, a twice-a-week patch. Now, if a person says, I feel a little bit better, but I'm still having hot flashes, then the next thing you do is to start to increase the estrogen dose upward. She comes back and says, you know, I'm still having hot flashes. Then the next thing is to change the estrogen preparation. I told you there's six different estrogen pills. So if she doesn't respond to one, she might respond to another. The next is if she's not responding very well to a pill, try a patch. If she's not responding very well to a patch, try a pill. It may have to do with her metabolism or the uptake of the, of the drug. The next step is, if she doesn't respond to any of these things, sometimes adding a little bit of testosterone may actually help with the hot flashes. And there is a product which is a combination of oral estrogen and an androgen called methyl testosterone. Its trade name is Covarix. And there are some women who just don't respond very well to estrogen by itself, who when you give them estrogen and androgen will have an improvement in their hot flashes. And not only that, something that people have kind of picked up on the internet is if you're giving an androgen pill, for some women that also improves their libido um, to some degree. Now, the flip side is that NAMS is very clear in their guidelines that pills, patches, rings are perfectly fine, but what we don't want to do is give estrogen injections just because of the fact that we're not so sure of the dosage equivalencies, and if you give a person an estrogen shot and she has bleeding, then you can't get it back. It lasts um, for a long time. So again, what does NAM say about these various approaches, all these many, many uh, directions that we can go in? They say, you know, there's really no clear benefit to one route over another. However, transdermal estrogen therapy using a patch or one of the gels has a lower blood clot risk than oral estrogen. And I think that that is nowadays an undisputed fact. And the reason why is that when you take an estrogen pill, it has a goes from your gut into the blood supply that goes to your liver. And what it does is it increases your clotting factors. So it does increase the risk that you might get a blood clot in your leg or have that flip off and go to your lungs. That doesn't happen with patches, okay? And therefore, and for a woman who uses estrogen patch, her risk of a DVT or a pulmonary embolism is the same as it is for any woman who doesn't use hormones at all. So I'll tell you, if it were me, I'd be on a low-dose patch because I do think that they're... Um, marginally safer than using pills, although I think for most people the pills are safe as well, but I think the patches are a little bit safer. Now, the next point they make is that if the only problem is vaginal dryness and painful intercourse, but no hot flashes or other systemic problems, then just use topical estrogen in the vagina. There's no reason to, to use pills or patches. With either route, 
using a progestin is required in a woman who has a uterus to make sure that she doesn't get um, endometrial cancer. Okay, so that's where we are with the estrogen and progesterone therapy. Now, there, as I also mentioned in an earlier slide, there's also yet another new drug out on the market. This one's been out for maybe a year or so, which is a combination, CE stands for conjugated estrogen, and a CIRM, which is called basidoxaphene. So basically what this product does is that the estrogen treats hot flashes, sleep problems, vaginal dryness, and so on, but it doesn't have a progestin in it. Okay, it has instead this CIRM, which is called mesodoxaphene, that prevents the endometrium from developing endometrial cancer. So it reduces hot flash frequency and severity, prevents um, loss of bone mass, treats GSM symptoms, no increase in endometrial cancer, um, and basically uh, things like vaginal bleeding and breast tenderness were observed, but about at the same rate as in the placebo group. So this seems like a really good alternative, particularly for women who use estrogen and progestin and they have side effects from the progestin. The trouble is it's so new that most health plans don't have it on their formulary yet. So if your doctor or nurse practitioner tried to prescribe this to you, you'd probably be told by your health plan that either they don't cover the cost or they might cover like half the cost. But over time, I think more and more health plans will cover this because it really is a... Although it is an expensive alternative, it's a good alternative to being able to use estrogen without having to use a progestin. So it's nice to be able to see that on the market. So the next one to mention, and I brought this up a moment ago, is that for women who are sort of steaming toward menopause, but who are still having periods, still ovulating every now and then, and at risk potentially of pregnancy, then a low-dose birth control pill can actually do three things. So it prevents pregnancy. It it causes very regular predictable menstrual periods, which oftentimes perimenopausal women don't have. And it because they have estrogen in them, they relieve hot flashes as well. So better cycle control. Women who use the pill for at least a few years actually have a very significant reduction in ovarian cancer. Now, a logical question is, if I'm 48 and I can use the pill, how can I use the contraceptive patch? Or can I use the contraceptive vaginal ring? And the answer is, yeah, they probably work, although they haven't been studied as much as birth control pills in perimenopausal women. Other methods of birth control that have hormones like progestin releasing IUDs or Depo-Provera, really good for pregnancy prevention, but they really wouldn't help at all for hot flashes. But for a woman who's 48 with hot flashes, vaginal dryness, but still occasionally ovulating, birth control pills are a very reasonable choice. And then by the time she's 50 or 51, then go off the pill and see whether or not she still needs hormone therapy uh, as a treatment for hot flashes. Now, next is a topic that I know you're going to ask me about, and so I'll tell you in advance, and uh, <laughs> we'll see whether or not it's a popular pro uh, uh, statement or not that I'm going to make about this. But questions always come up about bioidentical hormones. So I've read on the internet, my best friends told me, I've read Suzanne Summers' book about the fact that bioidentical hormones are somehow better than what I get at CVS or Walgreens in order to treat my hot flashes. And this was from one of Suzanne Summers' books called The Sexy Years, when she said, then suddenly the seven dwarves of menopause arrived at my door without warning. Bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and all dried up. What was it that sent those wretched dwarfs packing natural bioidentical hormones? Okay, so what are they and where do they come from? So these are pretty much the same hormones I've been talking about. Estradiol, which is estrogen, various versions of progestin or progesterone, which are concocted in a compounding pharmacy and then made available to women as a way of treating their hot flashes. But as I told you in the, in the beginning, that in general, plants don't make directly available hormones. The places where hormones come from that are in these various products are either from the urine of pregnant mares. Okay, that's where you've probably heard of a brand name called Premarin. It refers to pregnant mare urine, basically, where these estrogens come from, eight different kinds of estrogen. Or they come from yams, 
um, not exactly these yams. They're actually yam wild yams that come from Puerto Rico. These are Marin Farmer's Market yams. But the only picture I had of a yam. So what, but even in a yam, they don't make estrogen. They make estrogen precursors, and then in a huge factory somewhere, they take the precursors of estrogen that come from the yams, and then synthetically, they're made into estrogens and into progesterone. So the vast majority of 17-beta um, estradiol, which is the name of the estrogen that's used in all of these products that I just mentioned, they come from various factories all over the world that take wild yams and use synthetic chemical steps to turn them into estrogen and progestin. And that's true whether you get it from a compounding pharmacy or whether you get it from Walgreens or CVS or some other pharmacy. It's the only place where it comes from. So the way that compounded hormone therapy is marketed as we only use natural hormones, the same ones that come from the ovary. We use a number of different varieties of estrogen estrone, estradiol, estriol. We do a salivary test looking at your hormone levels and then we tweak the dosages in your compounded hormone therapy to make sure that it's tailored to you. We only use very pure products and we use very safe delivery systems like under your tongue, okay? The reality, as I've told you, is that the very same hormones are used in commercial products that come from a pharmacy and these products which come from compounding pharmacies. They're basically the same thing, okay? So these compounded hormones will probably work as well as anything you buy in a commercial pharmacy. But if you take progesterone and put it on the skin in the form of a cream, it never makes it into your skin. Can't be absorbed. Can be absorbed from the vagina, but not from the skin. Compounded hormone doses aren't standardized. Salivary hormone levels, which the compounding doctors and pharmacies all we often recommend, are not useful. And NAMS and the large majority of standard medical organizations say, when we give people hormone therapy, we find out how they're responding by how they feel. It doesn't matter what their blood level of estrogen or progesterone or DHEA or testosterone is. Like, who cares? What matters is, does the, people, does the person feel better when they use their hormone therapy? That's how we judge whether or not the doses are important. And so the bottom line is that FDA-approved hormone therapy products do give you bioidentical hormones. They give you a choice of different delivery systems, whether it's pill patch ring and so on. And it's much more likely that your health plan will cover it. Health plans don't pay for bioidentical hormones for the most part, and they run at a minimum of around $100 a month. So would you rather pay $100 a month for the compounded hormones or would you rather go to Walgreens and get your prescription for a 17-beta estradiol patch where your copayment is $20 for something which is an equally safe and effective delivery system? Seems to me, and certainly what I tell my patients, is that it's the same drugs no matter where you get them. And therefore, we'll figure out what you need based on how you feel and you'll have your prescription drug coverage cover most of that cost rather than having to use the compounded therapy. And the last slide that I have on this topic is just to say that the FDA has kind of caught wind of a lot of these claims that some of the compound, compounding pharmacies make. And they're saying to consumers, take those claims with a grain of salt, that a lot of what the compounding pharmacies claim, or at least some of them claim, really isn't based on any fact. It's based on marketing, and that we really need to sort out the myths from the facts. All right, so one last thing, and then I'm going to summarize in about five minutes or so. I don't want to be accused of telling you about all the good things that these therapies do. I got to also remind you that there are some risks. And one of the risks I've told you about already, probably the one that's the most significant, is that whenever you take an oral estrogen pill, and it's true whether it's a birth control pill or it's true whether it's a hormone, I mean, a hormone pill for menopause, is that it increases the risk of developing a blood clot in your leg, which can then flip off and go to your lung, lungs. rather. So those are called VTE. That stands for venous thromboembolic event. But just think of it as a blood clot in the leg that then flips off and goes to the lungs. And oral hormone therapy increases the risk of venous thromboembolic uh, episodes in postmenopausal women. The risk is really low, but it's still more than women who aren't using hormone therapy. So it starts right after you initiate hormone therapy, and then the risk actually decreases over time. 
If you're going to get a blood clot, whether it's on the pill or whether on one of these products, you'll get it in the first year. And the reason why is that if you're a person who naturally just has more blood clotting than other people, and then you make that worse by using an estrogen medication, it's going to manifest itself in the first year. And if you don't have the problem in the first year, you won't have it uh, afterwards. That's why the risk reduces over time. There's a lower risk of venous thromboembolism in women who are under 60. It's less likely to happen with lower doses than with higher doses. It's less likely to happen with a patch rather than oral estrogen therapy, and it's still a fairly rare um, event. The next risk, and, and I'm sure you would ask me about this one, has to do with breast cancer risk. And this is just hugely controversial and still being elucidated by new evidence all the time. But the conventional wisdom is that estrogen can be a weak promoter, but not an initiator of breast cancer. So what that means is that if a breast cancer is already developed, if that breast cancer has estrogen or progesterone receptors, ER positive or PR positive, estrogen or progesterone receptor positive, then the thought is, is that hormones can make it grow faster and maybe spread faster, but it didn't cause the breast cancer. That's happening because of genetics and mutations and that kind of thing. Estrogen doesn't cause it, but maybe it, ca it causes it to grow faster and spread, cancer, uh, spread faster, okay? And then based on 30 or 40 years of research, and including the Women's Health Initiative, the progestin seems to be a little riskier than the estrogen does. And therefore, the conventional wisdom is that women who have had a history of breast cancer shouldn't use either estrogen or progestin for the rest of their life because it might cause a recurrence of their tumor. Now, there are a few exceptions to that rule, but in general, we still follow it, okay? Now, how much more risk does it add? And this comes from the Women's Health Initiative. So if you use estrogen and progestin therapy for more than four or five years, it would cause an additional about five cases of breast cancer per 10,000 women per use of estrogen and progestin therapy. But we don't start to see that increased risk until year four or year five. So for a few years of using estrogen and progesterone therapy, your breast cancer risk doesn't increase. But if it's been four or five years or longer, it does start to increase to the tune of about one additional case of breast cancer per 2,000 women per year. Interestingly, estrogen only doesn't do that. So the WHI showed, because part of the w, uh, Women's Health Initiative was done in women who had already had a hysterectomy, who only used estrogen therapy. And all the way out to seven years of using estrogen, those women had no higher rate of breast cancer than women who were in the placebo group. And we also know that from other studies, basically shows the same thing, that if estrogen is related to an increased risk of breast cancer, that increased risk doesn't start to show up for at least five years of use. So now the conventional wisdom is, if you've never had breast cancer, that using hormone therapy for a period of time less than five years will not increase your risk of breast cancer. But longer than five years, every additional year slightly adds to your risk of breast cancer. Then the last thing to mention about risk is, does, is hormone therapy related to heart attacks? And the answer is, it all depends on how old you are when you use them. So this does come from the Women's Health Initiative, the WHI, and it says if you use hormones in your 50s, your risk of a heart attack actually goes down by 7%, and your likelihood of dying in comparison to women who don't use hormone therapy is reduced by 30%. That's really profound to reduce your likelihood of death by that much. But in your 70s, your risk of a heart attack actually goes up by 26% if you use hormone therapy, and your risk of death goes up by 14%. So it's another reason for one of those rules that we're very willing to use hormone therapy in women who are in their first 10 years after their menopause. But the older they get into their 60s and 70s, then the less enthusiastic we are about using hormone therapy. Okay, so sort of the bottom line about how we practice menopausal therapy nowadays is to be very tailored in the approach that we use and not to assume that one size fits all, okay? So each woman's informed of the potential benefits and risks. The acceptance of, of those risks kind of varies with why are you doing this, you know? Terrible hot flashes, you can't work. You're willing to accept a little more risk than the woman who just has very mild symptoms. That the risk-benefit ratio is definitely more acceptable 
if you're only using it for a year or two, particularly in younger women, that long-term use of hormone therapy, like 10 years, especially in older women, is far less accept, uh, acceptable because it's not doing very much, but it's increasing risk. And then women with premature menopause, particularly women in their 30s and early 40s who just have a early menopause or who have a surgical menopause, they can have terrible hot flashes. And we try very hard to, to help those women get treated just to avoid the kinds of hot flashes that, have if, that the women can have with an early menopause. So this is just sort of a summary of what I've said already. The step-by-step the -step we do of treating hot flashes is if you have mild symptoms, just try exercise, lifestyle changes, maybe a yoga class and botanical therapy. The, or, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, like uh, black coash. The indications for hormones is if you have severe hot flashes, if you've tried non-hormone therapies and they just haven't worked, and then there are some women who say, geez, these hot flashes are killing me. I can't work. I can't sleep. Uh, I feel tired all the time. Will you please give me industrial strength hormones? And I think it's perfectly reasonable just to go straight to that level for women whose lifestyle is just completely disrupted. Okay. And then, of course, when women can't use estrogen, I've already told you about the SSRIs, gabapentin, or using progestins alone. Then after two or three years, we try a period of discontinuation. Maybe with the SWAN study, we'll make that longer. But at least for now, we use it for two years and then try to discontinue it. For sleep and irritability symptoms, if they're mild, try lifestyle changes or botanicals. If they're severe sleep symptoms or you just don't get better, then we'll start with low-dose hormone therapy and titrate upward. For women who have a lot of mood swings that are related to their hormone therapy, patches are definitely better because the release rate of the hormones are very level rather than having ups and downs the way you do with a pill. And if a woman has hot flashes and depression, depression rather, makes sense just to go straight to an SSRI. So use Paxil or Proxy, one of those guys, or Effexor, as a way of treating both the depression and treating the hot flashes at the same time. Now, what about women whose only complaint are vaginal dryness symptoms or painful intercourse? One of the things I want to point out is probably one of the best treatments for vaginal dryness and painful intercourse is actually not a hormone. It's a lubricant. So there's a variety of products sold in every drugstore and every um, grocery store that are called intimate lubricants. Okay, you see them advertised on late night TV all the time. But it's not just KY. It's things like Astroglide and Sliquid, things that are water-based but have a little silicone in them. And they try really hard to recreate natural vaginal lubrication. They do a really good job of it. And so I will never prescribe vaginal estrogen for a woman until she's at least tried a lubricant because for a lot of people, that's all they need. That's different from a vaginal moisturizer. And there's a product called Replans, which helps with vaginal dryness during the day, but it gets really clumpy during intercourse. So it shouldn't be used during intercourse, instead one of the lubricants. And of course, they're sold everywhere, including the internet, uh, without a prescription. But if that's not enough, then vaginal estrogen therapy is available. For some women who have hot flashes and vaginal dryness, systemic hormone therapy will also take care of their vaginal dryness. And there's yet another new drug on the market, which is called ospemaphine or osphenol. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. You've probably seen this um, advertised on television. So again, if you only want to treat vaginal symptoms, then you only use vaginal estrogen. When you give vaginal estrogen, even to a woman who has a uterus, she does not need to use a progestin because so little of that estrogen makes it from the vagina into the bloodstream that there's no risk of hyperplasia or cancer. So that's the one case where we're willing to give estrogen by itself without a progestin. And I've already told you about the lubricants alone helping vaginal dryness and, uh, and painful intercourse. So this gives you an idea about some of the products that are out there. There are two different kinds of vaginal creams, estrace cream and premarin cream. They used to be really inexpensive. And unfortunately, their retail price has gone up to like $150, even at Costco. It's ridiculous. But you can get different kinds of coupons and stuff for a lower price. There are two different rings. One is called Estring. It's a lower dose ring. The other is called Femring. It's a higher dose ring. But each of these rings lasts for 90 days. 
So a woman gets a prescription for a ring, puts it in her vagina, it's going to work for the next three months. But what a lot of women find is that it kind of gets in the way during intercourse. It's a little bit, well, let's say about the same size as a contraceptive diaphragm. So a woman just slips the ring out when she's going to have intercourse and then puts it back in uh, after she has intercourse. But they work really well. And for some of my older women who have pessaries, we also use the S-ring right behind the pessary, and it really helps. And then there's actually a vaginal tablet, which is called Vagifem, where just a tablet is tucked into the vagina. So there are lots of different ways to get estrogen into the vagina. And then the newest product, again, that you've probably seen on late night TV, is called Osfina. And it's another one of those selective estrogen receptor modulators. But in this case, it's very specific for the vagina. So let's say this is a woman who had breast cancer, a woman who's tried estrogen and has had lots of side effects, but she has substantial vaginal dryness or painful intercourse. That's what dyspronia is. Then here's an oral tablet that's FDA approved to help for that. So there's an improvement in painful intercourse, an improvement in vaginal dryness, and the vaginal pH goes down into the acidic range where it should be. So again, a new drug, not on a whole lot of health plan formularies yet, relatively more expensive. But for a woman in whom uh, using a intimate lubricant is not enough, maybe they've tried a vaginal estrogen preparation or tried it and it didn't work, then Osfema is another alternative in terms of treating um, vaginal dryness. Now, I also mentioned at the beginning that there can be urinary tract problems, and estrogen may help that as well, particularly top, topical estrogen. So what estrogen therapy in the vagina may do is to help with overactive bladder or urge incontinence. It's very clear that for postmenopausal women who have frequent bladder infections, recurrent cyst, it's called recurrent cystitis, that using vaginal estrogen really cuts down on recurrent bladder infections, and then the, that burning on urination that can happen. Doesn't help stress incontinence, and in the WHI, it actually made it worse. There is no product approved in the United States which is specifically for bladder health, but we use estrogen topically to do all these different things that are on the list. Now, is there any value of hormone therapy to improve sexual function? And the answer is, yeah, it makes intercourse much more comfortable, but and I've already told you about osfina, it doesn't do anything to libido. So estrogen by itself doesn't help with, with a fl l lagging sex drive. It doesn't make you want to have intercourse anymore. Neither does progesterone. Testosterone, absolutely. And there has been tons of research done with a product that didn't quite make it to market, which was a progest I'm sorry, testosterone patch for women to improve libido. And that's exactly what it did. But the FDA didn't approve it because of the fact that there weren't enough people involved in the study. If it were a bigger study, it probably would have been improved. And then again, in the paper this morning, I didn't make a new slide. You might have read about a product which is called flibanserin, which actually has uh, an effect on the brain to improve sex drive. And that probably will be approved by the FDA within the next year or so. But it's not um, estrogen or estrogen-like. So Estrogen makes sex more comfortable, but it doesn't increase sex drive at all. Now, we're running out of time, so I won't go through this in much detail. What about the value of estrogen to prevent hip fractures or to prevent vertebral fractures? And so the answer is it works. It does help to replace some of the lost bone, okay? But it doesn't do it as well as some of the other medications that are out there. So the bisphosphonate drugs like Fosamax and uh, Actinel and Boniva clearly work better to prevent fractures than estrogen does. Now, the value of estrogen is the fact that if you're taking it for another reason, taking it for hot flashes or vaginal dryness, then it may also protect your bones. But we very rarely use estrogen by itself as a way of preventing fractures because we have many better alternatives um, in the form of the bisphosphonates. Then the very last point then is what about using hormone therapy just for sort of quality of life. I still see women who are in their 60s, 70s, even occasionally in their 80s who say, my doc put me on estrogen back when I went through menopause. It makes me feel better. It makes my skin feel more supple. It helps me sleep at night. It gets rid of my hot flashes. I feel younger and peppier. And every time I stop it, I feel worse. Okay, so we never give estrogen to try to improve quality of life because we're not so sure 
that it actually does that. But for a woman who's been on it and she's not having problems with it and she's absolutely convinced that it improves her quality of life, then basically what Nam says is that it's reasonable to continue using hormone therapy in women who feel better on it and worse when they go off it. But we should use the lowest dose possible and every few years see if we can go ahead and discontinue it. Okay, last slides I'm just going to skip over, but they basically say I've told you a lot about how you start this and when you use it. Then the last question is how do you stop it? So after a couple of years of using hormone therapy, we say, you know, you may not need this anymore. So we recommend what's called a drug vacation. You can just stop using this. Then the next question that comes up is should you wean yourself off slowly, slowly, and then stop it or just go cold turkey? And the best scientific answer seems to be, doesn't really matter whether you go cold turkey or whether you wean yourself off it. The likelihood you'll go back on is about 25%. The likelihood you won't need it anymore is about 75%, irrespective of whether you wean or whether you um, continue. And again, I, I apologize that I didn't have the time to go through the whole issue of the Women's Health Initiative, but I'll tell you in, a, in just a soundbite that the WHI was intended to answer the question, if women take hormone therapy over an extended period of time, will it prevent heart attacks or strokes? And the answer to that, particularly in older women, seems to be no. It doesn't really increase the risk much, but it doesn't decrease the risk much either. Okay, But after the results of the WHI were published, hormone therapy got a very bad name. Hormone therapy dropped by about half as a result of the WHI, and it's been slowly coming back up ever since then. And this was published about a year ago, now a little bit more than that now, a couple of years ago in 2012. A decade after the Women's Health Initiative, the experts do agree, and this was endorsed by 15 different medical associations, and that is that systemic hormone therapy is an acceptable option for healthy women in their 50s who are less than 10 years from menopause who have hot flashes. Not for everybody, not to prevent heart attacks, not to prevent strokes or even fractures, but if you're suffering from menopausal symptoms and you're within 10 years of menopause, it's a perfectly reasonable choice for you to make. But again, we're going to individualize therapy. It's not one size fits all, and it's a matter of trying to balance quality of life priorities and risk factors. Okay, very last slide. And that is if you want more information, there are just so many books and websites and all that kind of stuff. This, in my opinion, is the best book for consumers ever written about menopause called Hot Flashes, Hormones, and Your Health. It was, it's written by an internal medicine doc who's at Harvard, whose name is Joanne Manson. She's also currently the president of the North American Menopause Society. But she's a really good writer and I, th I thought did a really good job of taking all this information about the WHI and making it very clinically understand, uh, understandable and readable in her book. So there are many different alternatives out there in regard to books, but I think Joanne's is the best in terms of just a single easy read that um, will tell you even, even more than what I was able to tell you tonight. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up, and thank you. <laughs>